So I'm Colleen, and it's a huge uh, privilege to be here today and have the honor of kicking us off and modeling what I hope we'll all be doing today, which is introducing ourselves, talking about how we want to hack or how we are hacking the legal system, what we want and need from the other people in the room today. Some of you have, uh, I've just talked to a few of you, but some of you have come from all around the world, all across the country, and you're here for a reason. If you have something very specific you want to get done, we want to hear about that and also what you can offer to the other people in the room. So I want us to all think about that. I'm going to sort of model that with my talk, but at the end we will go around and there will be a quiz. I'm going to ask you all to uh, stand up and tell us a little about why you're here and what you can offer. Mm -hmm. So in that vein, let me do that now and show how uh, one way of doing it. So I'm Colleen. I'm a mom to two. I teach at Santa Clara. Uh, I want to hack the legal system to improve the patent system and unlock opportunity for people with criminal records. I want to connect with others who are interested in this work as well. Um, and in this speech, uh, which I'm just extremely honored to be giving, I can offer my story and my experience. So let me do that now. Since this is a Legal Hacker Summit, I'm going to reveal the single hack I have through this talk, which is to use data to lift up and tell stories. And a couple of the people that have inspired me to do that are women like Florence Nightingale and Ida B. Wells, who use their voices and their data to tell the stories of, in their cases, soldiers and lynching victims. You might know Florence. She was a nurse and statistician who went to take care of soldiers during the Crimean War. When she went, the conventional wisdom that soldiers were dying from war wounds. But as she documented, month after month, the actual cause of death was not wounds, which is what's in the red, but actually diseases made mortal by poor sanitation in hospital, what's in blue. Her experience with dying soldiers, then her analysis, allowed her to spur a movement in medicine focused on hygiene. Ida B. Wells, many you may be familiar with her, was a reformer and a journalist in the United States who became aware of the horrors of lynching when she came back from a trip and found her friend dead being burned at the stake. Again, the news was that he had committed rape. But Ida found that this was not the reason at all. She called BS on this and thousands of lynchings from 1889 to 1922. Through her research, she gave voice to victims and put their experiences in context, writing sort of um, statements here about who had been lynched and what the causes were. So today, I'm privileged to use my voice and my data that I've collected to share two stories, the first about the patent system and the second about second chances. The first is about how a nuisance came to dominate our patent system. So for me, this story starts in 2011 when my son was six and I find myself spending a lot of time here <laughs> on the soccer field. If you're a parent, you probably spent time there as well. Um, and on the sidelines, the conversation would go, what do you do? I would say, I'm a professor. And then say, professor and what? And I would say, patents. And then the response was just silence after that. <laughs> <laughs> then a pained expression. And then on several occasions, I got something to the effect of, oh, you work in patents? Talk about a dysfunctional system. So from multiple friends working in multiple industries, I heard a story about a startup that had gotten a letter from a company that they'd never heard of, holding a patent they had never seen before, demanding that they pay the money they didn't have or get sued. And I'd heard about this in practice. As Jameson mentioned, I'd worked in industry for a while at Fenwick and West. And I heard about these patent trolls. But it seemed like basically a cost of doing business. Because the point of a patent system is, as the Constitution says, to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Or as Abraham Lincoln said, to fuel the fire of genius. A patent create a race, but they don't strictly require the winner to practice. That's the key thing. So under modern law, you don't actually have to practice your patent to, to have it. The difference here was that these victims were small. Although, to be fair, I'm in a room of entrepreneurs. Probably you all have your own startups. Um, but after I started writing about these issues, I got calls from a man who was in Chicago who had been sued over use of the scanner. A woman called me and actually cried on the phone about making payroll and paying her lawyer's bills. And these were the stories that I started to hear. These were people who were small business owners. They were asking not to use their names. They were embarrassed about what had happened to them. At that point, I decided to do what any curious person would do. I dug a little deeper. Based on Supreme Court precedent, in a law review article that I wrote, I devised a name patent assertion entity for firms that use their patents to sue others rather than to support the development of technology. I worked then to try to gather the data 
doing surveys and other types of data gathering to figure out what was happening among small businesses and startups. In December 2012, at a workshop at the FTC, I presented my results. And what we found was pretty staggering at the time, that not only was the share of PIE suits growing, but by 2012, 60% of suits were brought by people who didn't make anything. Um, what was even more surprising, though, was that 55% of the defendants were small, making under $10 million in revenue. So far from being the exception, the stories I had been hearing about on the sidelines of the soccer field, it looked like, were actually the new normal. And on Valentine's Day in 2013, during a hangout, Obama drew attention to the issue of patent trolls extorting money from startups. I had been lucky enough to meet the president earlier at a signing ceremony and been keeping <laughs> staff up to date about my research. That's about as close as I got. <laughs> I still, you know, pride myself on this picture. Um, but I never expected the president to use his bully pulpit to draw attention to the issue. Several months later, the White House released a report on this topic. I was completely shocked when it came out. Um, and they had announced a bunch of initiatives. Um, and I was pleased to hear mirroring recommendations I would made in a series in Wired. So be careful what you write. People might be reading it and putting it into the reports um, called the patent fix. So that was all extremely um, uh, you know, surprising and great until one day I got a call from DC to actually apply to work in the White House. Um, and I applied for and did not get the job. So here's another hack. Um, so at that point I said, what the hell? I'm not gonna let a silly thing like not getting the job stop me from doing the job. So I asked myself, how can I help somebody in the job do it? And I continue to research and write and keep in touch until one day the front runner dropped out and I got the job. Mm. That fall, I joined the White House as the first White House senior advisor on innovation and intellectual property and started this crazy commute between DC and the Bay Area. I got on planes, ate a lot of peanuts, and the kids continued to play soccer. <laughs> when I was in DC, Congress held a bunch of hearings. They didn't actually end up doing anything, Congress. Um, but the Supreme Court, it appears, was listening and decided a record number of patent cases in ways that had advanced the ideas we had recommended. The PTO also carried out a bunch of initiatives and 32 states passed frivolous demand letter legislation. I told my mom about it, I was really proud, and she said, my mom, my Chinese mother, 32 states passed legislation, what about the other 18? <laughs> <laughs> These interventions, as well as Supreme Court decisions since then, have contributed to a much needed correction in the patent system. A free focus on innovation, not litigation. But now there's been a correction that there has been, uh, there's a concern there's been an overcorrection. So I continue to work on these issues, focusing on issues that impact small innovators, inequality, regional innovation, patent quality. So if you're interested in any of that, I'd love to talk to you. That's my first story. My second is about how second chances become mischances. And it starts not in the soccer field, but in mm -hmm. the law school classroom, where I am so privileged to be able to meet and keep in touch with a lot of inspiring young people, like the folks on these pictures. A few years ago, I met Letitia. Like many young women I meet, she was really impressive. She had a great attitude, initiative, and optimism. But her communication was really poor. So I would like write to her, and it would take her weeks to get back to my emails. And getting her to do simple things like sign paperwork was really difficult. Letitia Mendoza, not her real name, is an inmate in federal prison, charged over 10 years ago with a 20-year sentence for being a drug mule. I got to know her while preparing her <coughs> application for relief under Obama's signature clemency initiative. He was the first president to visit, uh, sitting president to visit a prison, and after doing that, set up a program to give clemency and priority to those who met a certain set of criteria, and this was aimed at trying to undo the damage of the war on drugs. Letitia was very impressive. She met all the factors. She was only 22, time, 22 at the time of her incarceration um, and had no history of violence. She had a job for her waiting when she left. She had a dad who had a business, and she, in my mind, was the perfect candidate. So we gathered the evidence. We uh, submitted her application to the clemency for office and planned for her release. But that's not how things worked out. Letitia's was one of the 8,000 petitions that was never reviewed before Obama left office. Because even though he was somebody who had granted more commutations than any other president, there was too much bureaucracy and not enough coordination to review all the applications. She never got her second chance. <laughs> so as I went back to teaching and research, her experience haunted me. How many people are getting 
uh, entitled to some sort of second chance relief, but aren't getting it because of steel bar, not because of steel bars, but because of red tape. So I started with the clemency project, which it turns out did not only have a backlog problem, it also had a problem that there wasn't consistent application of the criteria. When you actually look at all the data, only three to six percent actually of the folks received relief. That when they did re receive relief, it was a savings of 140 months off a sentence. So that's 11 years back of someone's life, a son, a son's life, a daughter, a mother, a sister, a brother, an auntie, and also a quarter million dollars of taxpayer money or more. Um, and so when I started digging deeper, I realized that she was not the only person for whom her second chance had become a mischance. The good news is that states across the country and the feds have enacted waves of these second chance laws and they provide for three types of relief. Early relief from incarceration, clearing of one's record, and reenfranchisement of the right to vote, to ex felons. But the bad news is that in most cases, to get your second chance, you have to apply for and claim it. I started documenting what I call the second chance gap, drawing upon the great work of legal services attorney, half our heroes right here in the front row, Matthew Steubenberg, Jason Tashia, and others. And uh, I was able to figure out that there was a lot of these um, gaps that were going on. So the work is ongoing, the data is hard to come by, but preliminarily I found that there is in my own sort of, uh, you know, homage to uh, Florence Nightingale, there is a lot of people who are not getting their second chance who are eligible for that. Um, one example is in California, we legalized recreational marijuana earlier this year, and we allowed people with marijuana sentences to clear their records from, from the past. And this is a big deal because having a criminal record can have these consequences like whether or not you get a job, get paid, um, whether or not you can get a loan, a lease, serve as a notary, and thousands of other consequences. So the issue was, again, that in California we didn't have, uh, you know, people were not applying for this. And so when you had these entrepreneurs like the D of San Francisco and the PD of Santa Cruz actually do the math, it turned out that a very small percentage of folks were doing that. I want to just point out that one in three Americans has a criminal record. That's more than voted for Obama in 2012, about the same number that has an undergraduate degree. So to me, this means that we have to move away from individualized treatment of each applic applicant to restore their second chance, and we need to work <coughs> and try to bring justice at scale. And here's where two kinds of code, I don't really have to tell the folks in this room, computer code and legal code can work to together to deliver justice and second chances. So this is why I'm so excited to hear you here today. Because as a legal hacker, I'm now working with hackers in all these different places at the state level in, with, with hackers at places like Code for America to use code and code to close these gaps. Um, and I'm really interested in, I would say, connecting with anybody who is interested in doing that as well. Um, so just to model, now what we're gonna go into briefly is that I'm Colleen from California. I'm gonna hack the legal system to unlock opportunities. Um, and uh, when I talk to people who are interested in closing the second chance gap, today I can offer any information about anything I've talked about, how to keep, you know, get a job even if you didn't get the job, um, how to deal with an Asian mother, anything <laughs> like that, you know, how to kind of live after that process, um, anything else, any, I would love to you know, talk to a mentor, be a sounding board to anybody who wants to talk about some of this stuff. Um, and so I look forward to hearing from all of you.